Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, guys. This is another episode of the Womanhood Conversation. I'm your host, Naima B. Robert, and delighted to have you back for another session where we are examining the whole concept and notion of what it means to be a woman in today's society. And today I have a fantastic guest for you, mashallah. She is Um Khalid. And if you don't know her, then you missed her conversation in the marriage conversation with her and her husband, brother Daniel. But I'm not going to even give any spoilers. Sis, Um Khalid, please introduce yourself. Tell the people who you are and what it is that you get up to. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, Jazakallah Khair Naima, for having me um, again on your podcast. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, and basically, I, um, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I, uh, I'm a homeschooling mom uh, for children, alhamdulillah. And what I do generally is just, uh, I write sometimes on uh, my Facebook page on these topics, the topics that I kind of live in my day to day, being a wife and a mother and what it means to live those roles in um, a secular kind of modern context as uh, in a traditional way, as a traditional Muslim, what that means and what that looks like, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of what I talk about involves feminism because that's the backdrop to all of this. Um, I also help my husband a little bit with um, courses on uh, uh, his platform, which is an online institute called Alasna Institute. The name Alasna coming from Alasna ala al-haq, the word of Umar uh, radiallahu anhu, when he asked the Prophet sallam, are we not on the truth, ya Rasulullah? Aren't we on the truth? Alasna ala al-haq. So anyway, so I help a little bit there. Um, one thing I did want to mention, speaking of Alasna, is um, coming up, inshallah, this in like four, four days, this Friday, inshallah, uh, October 14th, I'm really excited to actually um, uh, start or basically launch this new class that I'm inshallah going to be hosting called Wife School, which is exactly on this topic. I, don't know I saw you- that. I <laughs> saw that, mashallah. I was like, no, she got there first with the name <laughs> Barakallahu Fiha, oh, mashallah. So we can sorry. talk more about that. No, we definitely talk, talk more about that. And we'll put the link as well in inshallah. the description for everybody who's interested in jumping over there and getting the gems, which inshallah we will definitely talk about. So jazakallah kullu khair. Um, one of the things that I I notice on your Facebook is just how how honest you are, um, and I want to use the word uncompromising in a good way um, because I think that you get a lot of hate um, from people who get triggered by the things that you say, right? Why do you think sisters, Muslim women, because often it's Muslim women, it's sisters, mm-hmm. if you see their profiles, like they're in hijab and stuff, mm-hmm. but they are getting deeply triggered by your takes on motherhood, on being a wife, on being a mother, on being a Muslim woman. Why is that? What is going on? Well, I um, I think about it sometimes because I do find it fascinating. Why is it that the stuff I say, which to be honest, to me is like normal. (laughs) Maybe I'm the weird one, but to me, what I say is nothing revolutionary. It's nothing, you know, odd. It's nothing like out of the ordinary or nothing out of the norm that we should be raising our eyebrows at. But I get a lot of stuff, as you said, a lot of hate, a lot of people triggered, a lot of people just like clutching their pearls. Like, I just can't believe she said that. And in my mind, I'm like, said what, (laughs) you know? Right. But I think, um, I, I've, I think my, my thought, one of my thoughts is that it's, it's a product of the times that we live in, to be mm-hmm. honest, mm-hmm. and it's not only Muslim women, so I'm not trying to direct, you know, accusations at only Muslims, it's, 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 our, it's the product of our times regarding women in general, right, and yeah. including mm-hmm. myself, and mm-hmm. it's something I try to weed out in me, and I'm not free of it, I'm not innocent of it, so mm-hmm. I'm not trying to point fingers at others or anything, but I do think that women today, in the climate that we're in, the gynoc- gynocentric world that we're in, living in, no one can tell women the truth. That's the, the blunt, honest, goodness, truth. This is the conclusion I'm coming to based on my experience and based on what you see online, sometimes even in real life. It's not only online, but who can tell women the truth? Mm. I don't, I think the answer is nobody, nobody, mm, 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 mm. right? And I think this is very troubling and it's deeply, deeply concerning because when a man says, oh, sisters, you know, should do this, this, and this, or try to refrain from doing this, this, and this, that is a big no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like how dare you 
mm. say anything to women about women, you're not mm. a woman. You need right. to shut your mouth. You need to stay in your lane. You take several to, seats. Mm. Exactly. Take several seats back. You need to really just like step back and think about what mm. you've done because you're addressing women. How dare you? You're a man. You have wow. no in this conversation. And then if a woman tries to tell women, her fellow women, her sisters, you know, this is what Islam says, or this is what we should do or not do. <laughs> it's like, no, you are a self-hating woman. What about mm. the men? Like, why are you addressing the women? Is it all on the women? Um, right. Why are you not talking to the men? So men cannot talk to women. Mm. Women cannot talk to women. Mm. And so now who can talk to women? Right? SubhanAllah. Wow. It's so true. But before you get uh, down too far i want to just pull you up on that phrase that you use that that t- term that you used gynocentric right could you explain for people who've never heard that before or who don't know what it means what do you mean by gynocentric world well um it's basically a world that is catering to and built around the sensitivities of women this is how right. i define it at least but okay. this is how it truly seems to me. This is my perception of everything that, you know, the, the world around us, every, all the interactions that we see online, people's words and actions and people's words and actions in real life. Mm. And it's basically women, uh, because of the influence of feminism, because of the influence of many, many institutions. Actually, this is something, this is literally the topic of my first session, inshallah, for wife school, which is in a few days. So I've been prepping. So I think- Mashallah, I love it. I love it. But, you know, there's so many institutions and uh, 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 resources and um, environments that create this climate. They kind of craft, they've crafted a climate that we're in now where basically women mm-hmm. are goddesses. Astaghfirullah, yani, but in non-Muslim terms, you're a queen, you're a goddess, yeah. you're yeah. this, you're that. And no one can tell you otherwise. And you are perfect just, just the way you are. And some people refer to this as the women are wonderful effect. Women right. are Women are just wonderful. Right. You're perfect, just as you are. You're amazing. There's so many songs. There's so many books and things mm-hmm. that affirm these yes. kinds yeah. of delusions. But they're delusions. No one can tell you the truth. May I just say what's really interesting to me is how we've got Muslim versions of those books, right? Muslim girls rise. Uh, if we could use the word magic, I know people will be saying Muslim girl magic because it sounds really good, doesn't it? That's actually a really good right. one. <laughs> But, you know, no one's really going to do that. But Muslim girls rise, uh, powerful Muslim women, you know, all of this. We have it too, don't we, at the moment, subhanAllah. All right, so... so We're not immune. We live in a gynocentric world and we've been influenced by it. It's it's seeped into our psyche. So you mean it's not a patriarchy? Like we keep hearing? (laughs) What? What's happening here? (laughs) Well, okay. The patriarchy, I I don't deny the patriarchy or the existence of patriarchal societies throughout human history, throughout, Mm. you know, across space and time. I deny the fact that it's negative. Why is it a right. negative thing? Why is it mm. a bad thing? Well, right. this is the, this is the interesting thing because my son is doing sociology at the moment. He's studying sociology. So he came to me in the kitchen today and he said, oh, we were just covering three different types of feminism. So I said, oh, okay, tell me about them. So he said, well, there's, um, what would he say? There's radical feminism, there's liberal feminism, and then there's Marxist feminism, right? So I said, okay, what's the difference between them? So what was interesting to me was the the, the radical feminist view that the problem is men. The Mm. problem is men and maleness, uh, and by extension, patriarchy, the patriarchal society, patriarchal structures. And in fact, the whole society that we live in today with its hierarchy, with its dominance, you know, all of those things Mm. is a, a reflection of masculinity. And that is why the system is broken, right? And if you think about it, subhanAllah, like you see echoes of this. I I now, since since I kind of washed myself free of wokeism and took the red pill, haha, um, I I can now hear it. I can hear when somebody has 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 that kind of conditioning because mm-hmm. they they relate everything they they believe that the system is across the board is oppressive mm-hmm. is is bad is oppressive is rotten to the core and if women were in charge we would do better we would we, everything would be better if women were in charge is that is that is that kind of accurate would you say for people who are like on that 
Yes, I, I completely agree. I see it too. It's not just you, Naima. I see the same trends and the same patterns in women that I know. And this is not women online. This is not hearsay for me. This is literally conversations that I have with people mm. in my life, very, some very close to me um, and some acquaintances, some friends, and you know, some people within even my family or my extended family. Mm. So this is actually an issue that's very close to my heart. It's near and dear. It's not, you know, because I think sometimes when I write online on these things, um, or give examples. Sometimes people are like, who even does that? Who even says these things? Like mm. you are so far fetched and you exaggerate, and <laughs> right. you, you know, and I'm like making well, stuff up. Yeah, exactly. And what I can't say, I wish I could say, but I, what I can't tell them is this is one of my siblings. And we had this conversation yesterday. I'm not wow. making things up. This is, or this is a good friend that I grew up with, or this is someone I've known for 20 years. Mm. And we had this conversation face to face not on the phone, not, I didn't read this somewhere. I it know it's on a post somewhere. Mm. Exactly. So I'm writing a post, but I can't tell you who it is, but it's yeah. not, I did not make this person up and I didn't make this conversation up. And in fact, you are, if you've been, you know, Alhamdulillah, you're blessed enough not to be dealing with people like this or surrounded by these very scary and very dangerous ideas. That's mm. good for you, but not all of us live in that reality. Some of us live in this world where women are incredibly, some women, not, again, I want to be careful, not all women, not, you know, everywhere and, you know, not everyone, but certain women because of succumbing to certain very specific influences and agendas have, have been influenced. And this is how they talk. Like, mm. I'll tell you, Allah, one thing, one of the scariest conversations that I've had with a person very close to me was when I, um, uh, it's, it's a person who's very close to me, like a sister, like a very dear, dear mm -hmm. person. And she, uh, I told her once, Hey, you know what? Um, I just read an article that's deeply disturbing. And I wanted her to like share in my shock over it. Mm. It's really mm. shocking. So I told her, I read this article, uh, like this newspaper clip where basically it's a woman who I think she was Egyptian, Masriya, uh, but, <laughs> but she was an Egyptian woman who was married to this man. And for some reason she had some issues and she ended up killing him decapitating him so she cut off his head and then she chopped off his genitalia and she Whoa. likes she stuffed it in the freezer this is like jeffrey dahmer type stuff this I, like, that's exactly what i was thinking <laughs> wow it's it's, she yeah. says, this is psychopathic behavior and so the guess what this girl says that i'm having this face-to-face -face conversation with in my kitchen so i'm like you know isn't that so disturbing aren't you just shocked are you appalled i was appalled and she looked at me dead you know making eye contact she looked at me dead in the eyes and she said he must have done something to her i what knew did it he do to deserve it he probably deserved it he got what's coming to him because no woman would do that for no reason so what wow. was the reason what did he do and i i was well, like i had to pick my jaw up off the floor because i couldn't mm. believe what i was hearing because if you were to flip the script and we were talking about a man completely unacceptable exactly. completely unacceptable victim imagine, shaming victim blaming you know it's no it's, it's a definitely a no yeah exactly but this is the kind of stuff that women are allowed to get away with we're allowed to say that and like not by bad an eye we're not we, we yeah. and i just looked at her like horrified not just yeah. at the article but now i'm horrified at this reaction from her and she yeah. just looked at me like what what i say <laughs> well know? i think that's one of the things that i i notice uh in in this current climate is um different levels of distaste when it comes to men mm -hmm. so there's contempt mm -hmm. there's uh disdain uh there's suspicion uh there's hatred mm -hmm. uh there's almost this 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 characterization of men as the enemy right yes. they're always wrong mm -hmm. they're always the oppressors they are always to blame for whatever the situation whatever's happened and they are never worthy of respect and they're never worthy of empathy unless they are behaving in a way that we deem is correct and suitable for a man to behave what's going on with that I mean, honestly, I think uh, women are known for being uh, very, for having deep empathy. And this is a beautiful feminine trait that I agree most women do have lots of empathy. We sympathize very easily with others and we're sensitive to not just our own pain, but the pain of other people. So we, we have that ability to empathize, which I, is beautiful. I think that's beautiful. And it's, it is a feminine trait um, mm. that I think we excel at over men, for example, who maybe who they empathize, but maybe not to the same extent. But, yeah. Here's the big but in the times that we live in, 
women's empathy has been railroaded to only mm. include very specific groups, mainly other women. And mm. only not, not even all other women, only women who think the feminist way, the right way to think. Right. So we exclude from our feminine sympathy and empathy, we exclude most men because mm. they're toxic and patriarchal and the enemy. Mm. We also exclude some women yeah uh, because they are self-hating yeah. uh you know <laughs> pick me <laughs> <Pick me's. laughs> i've been called that you've been called that yeah we are the pick me club we love it yeah what is it called pick me nation <laughs> yeah pick me's so, up pick me's so up <laughs> so because i've already been picked I, i'm not you know subhanallah so it's like okay you subhanallah pick me it's already happened you're too late you should call me that before i got it's hashtag picked okay get it right <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it so you know so i think women's empathy is just like it's not it's been limited and it's been just dis- deformed mm, and mm. into this like selective empathy would you say that that women's sympathy and empathy and maybe compassion do you think that the current kind of i don't know whether the viewers on my channel will understand what i mean when i say sort of woke politics right but do you think that because i see women emoting and empathizing with other people not just women but mm-hmm. other minorities or people who are perceived as the oppressed right the underdog right mm-hmm. do you think that that is also where our empathy is being pushed towards as well because i see a lot of women making like they are the majority who are speaking on behalf of whoever the behalf of is some kind of marginalized group oppressed group you know um what, what are your thoughts on that Right. And I, I think basically women are good at empathizing with the victim. Now, this is That's a it. topic, right? Okay. This is the victim, right? We have, right. we have these concepts, even in the kind of current kind of uh, dominant mainstream culture, like, um, you know, victim blaming, don't, yes. don't like blame the victim, things like that. So we like this idea of the victim. And, and normally, I'm not saying that this is not true. There are no victims. Of course, there are victims mm-hmm. and things happen. And some people are truly oppressed and they've been truly mm-hmm. wronged and they are actually victims. So mm-hmm. I'm not denying any of that. But the bad thing is in our day and age, we have a victim problem. We have like a victim complex or a victim. Yes. Identity. And yeah. it's an identity. That this women- is it. That's it. The victim identity. It's like a crown that you put like on, right? Yeah. I was going to say it's like a cloak that you wear or yours is even better. It's like a crown that you put on your head because it gives you certain status. It's like yes. a, the victim status, which yes. confers upon you yeah. certain privileges and certain certain yeah. like and, oh and this is this is the thing so the the what is the opposite of a victim from what i can tell it's this idea of privilege so yeah the, the privileged have to be quiet they have to take a step back they have to mm. stay in their lane they have to just like not have anything to say because your privilege should shut you up you're yeah. privileged you have no room there's no space for you in this conversation yeah you, just need, yeah. To, you need to sit down because yeah. you're privileged so right. who's considered privileged men primarily men most and, and and interestingly enough men uh, straight men yes. as a whole yeah yes. as a whole as this monolithic group straight men specifically straight white men yes. they are definitely sort of enemy number 1 i would say but men can also all join that even if they're and, other races as long as they're straight they can be in that group too go and, on and in muslim and in muslim conversations it's that translates to straight like heterosexual muslim men which are yes. you know most muslim men yeah. so that's that's enemy number one that's like the most privileged it's like you need to really like no one wants to hear what you have to say you have nothing yeah. to say okay yeah. you know yeah. so mm-hmm. that's that's the privileged group and then right. the victim group on the other side of that the, in contrast we have the victim who has all the things in the world to say and they get to just unload and just mm. like vent and re- like kind of like word vomit on everyone Mm. else in the public space because they've been wronged and they need to you know count for you and list for you all the different ways that the privileged group has stomped on their neck and right yeah this whole is this dynamic you know do you think that is uh, i'm trying to kind of connect dots here so women in general we emote right? We, we, we empathize, we sympathize. I would say that we are more emotionally driven. Would you agree with that? As in our thinking is impacted by the way we feel. So the way that we will view a situation is heavily influenced by emotionally how we're, how we are viewing it. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. 100%. Yes. So then of course, that makes sense if, you know, if, if, if we're emotion and if we're emotional and we're being led by our emotions, then of course our empathy and sympathy is going to be with the one we think is wronged. Right. And the one that is perceived as wronged obviously is in their feelings too. 
right? Most of the time, it's a feeling. It's a feeling of being victimized. It's a feeling of being humiliated or marginalized or oppressed, right? And so now you've got this lovely feeling soup going on, right? Everything's feelings. Um, and I think what what gets completely sidelined in this festival of feelings is actual facts and and logic right and reality. rational and re- rational reality right and and where you see that the most and i've been observing this sis from the outside i'm not american mm-hmm. thank god alhamdulillah i'm so <laughs> pleased because it's so it's so bipartisan right in the us and i see this happening so much now where you have something like like blm for example right and george floyd and these cop like the, when there's a police killing Mm -hmm. And it's a huge festival of feelings, right? And of course, now it's a corporate sponsored festival of feelings, right? Because all the corporations feel they have to put money in and virtue signal and and let everyone know like how connected they are and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, how progressive they are and all that stuff. However, where it becomes untenable and starts to unravel is when people start to bring statistics and facts and and, 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 and data that just pushes the story over. It's like, well, yeah, okay, it looks like that. And you guys are all feeling some kind of way, but the reality is this is what happened or this is what's happening or these are the numbers. It's not the, the what's being created by this feverish kind of imagination. These are the facts. And it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a stark contrast, this. I can't get over it. It's, I think, well, like everybody has their own perspective and which is understandable because we see things from how we see them. We see things from where we're standing. We could all be looking at the same event, like this central event in the middle. And I'm standing here on this side and I see it from my angle and you're standing opposite me. You're seeing Mm -hmm. it from your angle and that's okay. And people on the left and the right, they're seeing things from wherever they're standing. So that's, there's nothing, you know, specifically wrong with that. But the bad thing is when we, and then, you know, from where we're standing, we see things in a certain way from our angle. And then we have certain feelings that come up Mm. about this. But the bad thing is when we start making laws or big decisions or, or Mm. like enacting things in reality that are limited to only this perspective that I have and the feeling that I have about it. If we can't if we can't rise above that to try to accommodate, okay, well, this is my perspective. This is what I saw. Mm-hmm. What did you see? And what did you see? What, you know, and what right. is the reality? And as Muslims, it's not just what you see and what he sees and or what she sees. It's what does Allah tell us? What does mm-hmm. Allah, because Allah, you know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the reality. Allah is the reality. He tells us things as they are, and we can feel whatever we feel about it, but Allah has the, the hukm. Allah gives us, you know, actual commands and Allah gives us guidance and how, what to do in what situation, what is actually just, what is actually fair, because our mm-hmm. feelings are fine, they're feelings and we're entitled to our feelings, but they are not always just, they're not always fair because they don't take into account everybody and Everything their pain. Else. We see our pain, but I don't see of your course. pain. Yeah. So for example, as a Muslim woman, I see Muslim women's pain and I extend yeah. that to I, that courtesy. I extend it to my sister on my left and on my right, mm-hmm. because I know the pain that I go through. So I'm like, well, she does too. And she does too, but I don't know the pain that men go through. So mm-hmm. I, in my limited feelings, kind of driven state of emotion, I don't, I just assume they have no pain, but, but mm-hmm. I just don't know what it is. So I just assume yeah. it doesn't exist, but it exists. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's as you're saying you know it's it's kind of this focus on seeing the world only through your own lens and and not even accepting that okay but that is just your lens okay it's not the you know this whole my truth oh this yes, is my I truth know. and this is your truth oh, and I, I, you have no idea how much I hate I hate that word I like the but word women love it women love it my, you put my before the word truth it's Oh, it's not it's, it's done but this is this kind of revol- this revolving around the self right that I wanted to us to touch on because I remember when you came for the um the secrets of Success- successful wives conference we had a really good live stream on feminism right and you mentioned this 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 I don't know whether it was a theory at the time but you mentioned you know 
the role of narcissism in the, the feminist worldview and sort of the gynocentric order as a whole. Can you just go into that a bit more, inshallah? Because I found it really fascinating. I've read more of your stuff since then on this issue. But break it down because we only ever hear about narcissism really about men, usually narcissistic husbands. Okay, that's what we keep hearing about. But what's your take on it? Yes, absolutely. So basically, this is an idea that I had, uh, I was not thinking about feminism at the time, but I was just, you know, dealing with some things and kind of observing some people and some interactions that I had seen. Um, and I was started really thinking a lot about narcissism, which again, I'm not um, promoting, I should put this disclaimer out there before people jump to conclusions. I am not um, endorsing or, you know, applauding the field of psychology as a whole, like secular liberal psychology that has its own messes and problems. Mm -hmm. But certain things, you know, it's, it's observable reality. You can tell, you can see. Yeah. And, it, you know, there are certain ways of um, kind of helping ourselves understand why people act the way that they do. Mm -hmm. So basically, I started reading up on and watching videos and doing research on this idea of narcissism and what it means and the manifestations of narcissism. Basically, mm -hmm. for people who aren't familiar, narcissism is just a pathology of the self. It's like, a, it's like when a person has a fractured sense of self stemming from various different things. Sometimes it goes back to childhood. Often it goes back to childhood and parenting mm -hmm. or lack of yeah. parenting. So a person can grow up with a fractured sense of self, very fragile understanding of who they are and, and a lot of insecurity, right? So mm -hmm. basically what happens is narcissists have a um, kind of a grouping, a cluster of hallmark features that there's different kinds of narcissism and all that. But just in general, this idea of the narcissist is a person who is um, not only selfish, but because that's like on the surface, it just seems like, oh, someone yeah. is selfish. But it's yeah. actually, it's, uh, when you think of like as a, as a pathology, this is what people have said. Basically, it is a person who has an exaggerated sense of self-importance to almost wow. overcompensate for their own mm. actual identity crisis and real... Um, real insecurity about who they are and if they're worth anything so then to mm. compensate what they do is they overcompensate and then they project this very grandiose over in, um, exaggerated sense of self-importance like mm. i am this look at me i'm the greatest i uh you know like there's different kinds of narcissists and you mean like yes queen <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly it. i deserve this and this i'm entitled yeah. I'm worth so, it. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. So the next piece of it after the first part is uh, an exaggerated sen sense of self-importance. Number two is an entitlement, a certain mm. attitude of Ooh. feeling entitled to certain things. I deserve mm. this, this, and this. This is how I deserve to be treated. This is the kind of man I deserve to be with. This is mm. what you this is what you owe me, right? People mm -hmm. are indebted to me. Why? Because mm. I deserve it. I am entitled. Right. You owe yeah. me what you owe me because, and I don't owe you anything because who's the victim here? Like the narcissist is both grandiose. Mm. Like I'm wow. this amazing person. I'm such a big deal, but also I'm the injured victim. I'm the injured party. I'm the wronged party, mm. but you need, wow. to, I need reparations. Do you know what I mean? Right. So yeah. So number two is entitlement. Number three is a lack of empathy for others. The narcissist in general tends to have a glaring lack of empathy for other people and the pain of other people, a sensitivity mm. to what they might be feeling. So a narcissist will do or say things without thinking, without a second thought about how it might make the other person feel while mm. randomly in a weird twist being hypersensitive themselves. They're hypersensitive <laughs> to criticism, but they are not at all sensitive to how they might affect other people and how they might right. make other people feel. So, and number uh, four is a victim complex. We this is all stuff we just touched on now, but yeah. this idea of being a victim. I am a victim. I'm constantly wronged. I'm just so oppressed. Like everybody's out to get me. The world, the, the odds are stacked against me. I, wow. people, have it, people have had it out for me from day one. Mm, mm, this mm, type mm, of mm. victim complex. And all the failures that they do, they they are, well, see, this I'm a victim. I tried to go to, you know, I tried to get a job and I was fired. I'm a victim. It can't be me. Yeah. You know? yeah. Or I tried to go to school and I flunked out. It wasn't me. It's so there's no self-accountability there. there. There's no accountability. There's no responsibility for personal actions. It's always, you know, outward. It's like, I'm a victim. Right. And the mm -mm. fifth part, um, th these things are all kind of related, as you'll see. But the fifth uh, kind of hallmark feature is uh, this is uh, the narcissist is a person who requires a convenient scapegoat, a scapegoat, someone you can pin all your problems on and blame things for. And it's this right. person, you know, is just constantly getting in your way and constantly sabotaging you. And they mm. are the reason for your failures 
not you, because it can never mm-hmm. be you because you don't know how to handle, because basically this idea of this fragile sense of self is too fragile to take on any sort of accountability or responsibility. To right, right. So it has to be, but then certain problems arise. So how do we solve that problem? Well, it has to be somebody's fault. It sure can't be mm. my fault. So it's got to be your mm. fault. You're, wow. the, you're the scapegoat. Mm, mm, mm. So... You can so see it, what, it's, feminism. It's on done me. what's like, what's happening here do you think that society and our conditioning is turning women into narcissists well that is actually what i think yes i do and i think it's uh maybe it's an unconventional claim to make or it might be a bold you know statement but i genuinely think based on things i've seen and people i've interacted with um i some women some women have fallen for um, it's a certain agenda and it kind of pulls you along for the ride. And if you're not careful, you will be turned into this very entitled narcissist who just is a taker who feels entitled Mm. to things, who Mm. thinks of herself constantly as the victim, constantly Mm. of the patriarchy. The patriarchy is usually the scapegoat and entitled. Mm. You have very little empathy and you have this exaggerated sense of who you are and your importance and mm. you're a queen, slay queen, you know, slay the patriarchy. Like, so these are things that are very damaging and no human being wants to deal with a narcissist, whether male or female, mm. but women, so how yeah. a lot are trained, you know, if they're not careful, they get trained in this Western secular feminist system. They get trained to be like this. So who wants to deal with that? Right? Nobody. Yeah. 100% there are some uh this as you're giving us these little uh I don't know sort of slogans it's it's reminding me of certain Instagram accounts that I used to follow that are they're toxic they they really 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 are toxic um I'm start naming them I, I want to find some so I can read them to you because I just say the level of the lack of self-awareness, I think, and the lack of humility is, is what, what stands out the most. You know, it's, it's complete entitlement. Um, you know, like you said, they're the center of the universe, right? You're, you're the center of the universe. Everything you do is, is the best for the best. And anybody who stands in your way basically is just a hater. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's crazy to me. It's, it's really crazy. And the unfortunate thing is that if you imbibe all those messages, you're actually not a very pleasant person to be around. Mm-hmm. And while your girlfriends might find it fun and cute and you're sassy and they're like, yes, girl, that's right, girl. That's it. You know, you deserve da da da. Ultimately, you don't want to settle down with your girlfriends, right? Many of us do want actually a partner, but what I see happening with especially this, um, especially this latest brand of very in your face, loud and proud, obnoxious feminist, feminist confidence is that it makes you utterly repulsive to men. It's they're utterly repulsed by it. Right. I don't know any man who has said, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm about. Yeah. That, that kind of entitled in your face, finger snapping attitude, having sassy girl. Yeah. That's my girl. What do you think? Well, you know what? You know what those men will be uh, accused of, though? They're intimidated. They can't. Oh, yes, of course. (laughs) It's like, why are men intimidated by strong women? And what I always want to say is, no, sweetie, they're not intimidated by you or your strength. They're repulsed by you and your obnoxiousness. That's what it is. That's what it is. (laughs) Check this one out. So did you ever hear the term a well-behaved man? I've never, ever heard it. It's always women who are well-behaved, girls who are well-behaved. For us, it's our turn. I'm done being well behaved. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so now husn al is a slur. Husn al khuluq. Husn al khuluq is good manners. Well, right. you know, well being well behaved, well, you know, conducting yourself well, carrying yourself well. That's that's essentially what well behaved means. And then we're done with husn al khuluq. Really? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, a lot of this goes against Islam and Islamic um, conduct, Islamic uh, conceptions of what it means to be a good human being, not just a good woman. 100%. Have, you know, we have standards for good women and good men and what that means. But even just a basic on a human level, regardless of gender, we have husn al We have this idea of trying to rid ourselves of kibr. Kibr, it's a very big disease of the heart. 
this yeah. thinking I'm better than you looking yes. down on other people mm. putting yourself above other people kind of putting yourself on this pedestal this is horrible this is dangerous islamically I have yeah. another one for you. Don't worry. It's related to that. <laughs> yeah. I have a limited amount of time left on this planet and I'm not going to spend it being a watered down version of myself just so people can like me. Oh, <laughs> that's edgy. That is very edgy. You know, so kind of like, it's just, it's really sad and it's really childish. Like as you're reading these off, aren't they like very juvenile? Like this is, this is like how a 13 year old girl talks, you know? Exactly, exactly. And, and, and these are big women, you know, the, the women who follow these, these channels, who create these channels, actually, are women in their 30s, uh, especially the, the large, I think the bulk of this particular channel's audience is mm-hmm. women late 20s into their 30s, mm-hmm. who are being sold this whole idea of being a boss babe, right? Mm-hmm. Being a boss babe, being a bad bee, you know, securing the bag and, you know, no man's going to do this and no man's going to do that. You know, I'm too busy chasing the bag to chase a man and all of this this very so much bravado right so much bravado and I want to hear your opinion on this because I was having this conversation with my sons and they were like mom stop hating on these these women in their 20s you know who are kind of going through their thing like let them have their fun halas like you know why are you talking about them and Mm -hmm. I said you know what the the marketing and the spin is really effective in the 20s and in the 30s because these ladies now they're in their 30s and they still look young you notice Mm -hmm. 30 year olds nowadays it's hard to tell if somebody is like 32 35 they look like could be in their 20s right and they've now got their career they've got their money they've got their designer brands they've got all this cool stuff right they're traveling they're having girls trips doing all their stuff so 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 you know the marketing is great Mm -hmm. where you will hit a, a really big roadblock is when they're in their 40s and 50s and 60s because at that point the marketers have nothing to say because the truth of their situation becomes very clear now they will come up with something right they they always do they'll come up with a way to spin it so that oh yeah it's okay like you're winning at life but we all knew sex in the city what happened in sex in the city they sold this idea right that you could be in your 30s into your late 30s and basically sleeping around and you know living for money and alcohol and all of this stuff but you'll still find a man you know your dream guy is still going to snap you up and you know you're going to ride off into the sunset well, we know that's not true. Exactly. And this is this is the lie that's been sold to women. And I think it's one of the saddest and most tragic things that have happened because of feminism and this gynocentric world and this this messaging that we're bombarded with is, as you said, it's perfectly apt in your 20s, like late teens, early 20s. Um, women are, women feel like they are very powerful. They're at their peak and they are in fact at their peak in terms of beauty, youth, um, vitality, Mm. fertility. So there are actually, it's actually biologically driven or biologically rooted. So women, you know, subhanAllah, I mean, this is a, a vast, vast topic, but basically, so women are, they feel valuable, but what they do is they squander it. What they do is, but they don't understand that. They see it as, oh, I have to become empowered. I have to find myself. Having my fun. Exactly. I need find to just- myself, live my best life. No, best living exactly. your best life is for later on. That's in your 30s, right? That's when you start exactly. to say, I'm living my best life. Yeah, but before exactly. that, it's I'm having my fun, hot girl yeah. summer, all of this madness. I'm trying to, and the whole, the whole, I'm trying to find myself. Like, are you lost? And I think the, that is actually, there's some truth to that. These women are lost. Some of them yeah, are lost. Yeah. If no, they, they are not raised in a certain way, mm. being taught their purpose, being taught the, who their creator is and how we worship our creator, what we were created to do and what our roles are in life, what our priorities should be, then you are lost. And you really do have to find yourself because you're absolutely lost. You don't know anything. So yeah. you have to go and stumble about and wander around to find yourself. But unfortunately, what happens is you'll make a lot of mistakes Mm. And you, uh, you waste a lot of time and a lot of resources. And then you hit your thirties, as you say, and then now you are starting to feel a little bit anxious, maybe mid thirties, late thirties, you start to get a little bit panicky. You're alone. Uh, life is fun, but it's not quite as satisfying as it maybe had been in your twenties, hot girl yeah. summer, all that. And then you're, and then you're, as you're saying, you become, I have heard it called invisible. When women become invisible, it's basically older women. Men no longer pay attention to you. You don't get the same kind of attention that you used to Mm. in the comment section, your likes on your Instagram selfies, 
everything starts to go down. And then you look around and you say, oh, how did this happen? I'm alone. Yeah. I'm 42. Yeah. I'm alone. And, you know, then you start to get the cats. You get a few cats. You know, it's crazy. So how long you know, I remember um, uh, I remember seeing uh, an interview that Jordan Peterson did. I can't remember what it, who it was with or whatever, but he was talking about how, as you said, women were sold this idea that the career was the thing, right? Uh, Self-actualization and empowerment through education and career was the thing. And the reality of it being that at the end of your life, that's not what will count. It's the time that you invested in building a home and building a family and building a life for you and your spouse and your children, right? That is what pays dividends in the end, right? Even if you didn't secure the bag, right? Because the bag, the bag at the end of this, it's like, you know, people who sacrifice themselves for a career and then they get fired, right? right. Because yeah. your job can do that. Your job can replace you anytime, right? And and he, I think he, his point in this was women have, have, have been, it's like they're t- trying to deprogram mm-hmm. our biological desire to be mothers and to build a nest and to like raise like the next generation and to, to establish a, you know, a lineage. We're being deprogrammed and we're being reprogrammed with all of this stuff that while it helps the capitalist society to grow and proliferate and be this amazing space of innovation and massive wealth and all of this leaves us empty in the end, right? Everyone really, because obviously the dunya can never fill our bellies at the end of the day, but especially, especially cruelly women, because we are the ones who trade our fertility for the career. Men don't do that. Men are not being told to not have children and have careers instead. We're the ones being told that, right? Right. And And I I just, go on. No, sorry, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. Oh, I was was just going to say that this idea to me, when I learned it uh, a few years ago, I didn't always know this, but it blew my mind, this idea of the fertility window. Right. I'd never heard that term before, but as Muslims, we have this kind of intuitively or within our generally Muslim cultures, you know, you get married at a somewhat of a young age, kind of, this is just in our culture. I'm I'm just, you know, like in general, like Arabs have this, Daisies have this, Muslims tend to have this. Every single Uh, traditional culture in the entire creation has had that at some point in time because it does make sense (laughs) even non-muslims it's not about religion it's biological and how allah has created us even if people do not believe in allah they still it's like the reality of the situation the fitra is what the fitra is you know exactly that's exactly it so so we have this idea of women getting married earlier and men too especially in previous generations men also married earlier but they, they had a little bit more time than women and basically what i learned was the fertility window of women is very short and it comes early in yes. life yeah. late teens or mid-teens even biologically um until, until maybe late 20s or very early 30s in that kind of range you're and you know at 35 years old we know it's a geriatric pregnancy right mm. geriatric meaning like elderly because yeah. you're kind of pushing the limits yeah. the very you know end limits of that fertility window as a woman and this is biological you can't hate on it you can't say it's bullying you this is your biology telling you right so you're not a victim this is just how biology works mm-hmm. and then for men they also have a fertility window but it extends so much decades after the women's fertility window ends the man's fertility window is still open and it ends sometime in his like 70s you know men Mm. can father children when women can no longer bear children so it's a very different calculation and i think the trick that feminism has played on modern women is to promise women that if they have if they have the same lifestyle as men and do the same actions Mm. as men that they will have the same outcomes as men right patently false this is unbelievably false because of biology and because of looking at your fertility window you do not have the same fertility window as a man so he Mm. has options that you don't have Mm. and it's not because of the patriarchy it's just how Allah created us. It's this is idea. This is when I say reality, right? <laughs> we do not like reality, but this is reality. And I, if it hurts your feelings, I'm sorry, but you either deal with it and you with your eyes wide open, right? And you make informed decisions mm. to benefit you, not to benefit me or someone else or the patriarch, to benefit yourself. Mm. Or you close your eyes like a two year old and say, no, 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 I don't see it. I refuse to see it's it. It's a social construct. 
biology is a social construct and you know this this is this is i think i think and i could be wrong if i am please correct me you either you or somebody one of the viewers but um the critical theories right critical race theory critical class and all of the rest of it right the critical theories i think they specialize in pulling things apart right and mm. and and problematizing things so for example uh biology right nature versus nurture okay what is truly our nature and what is it's just a social construct is something that society has put on us and the thing is it's interesting because even our own not even not i'm not going to say even having a conversation with your own children who mm. may have been in the school system you'll find that they have imbibed these ideas these critical theories right where they will like if you bring an example of a traditional household to them for example from islam mm-hmm. they'll say that's a social construct right it's not to do with biology right why should it be the man who does this and the woman who does that and if you try to say biological it's like no 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 it's cultural it's a social construct it's you know it's 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 made up basically right it has no bearing and we can change our biology we can change the way we're wired Mm-hmm. And I, I remember having this argument with my son and he was saying, like, if, if enough generations embrace a certain thing, you can rewire human beings to actually see things differently. Right. And at the time I argued with him. But when I see these Gen Z's and the ideas that they hold about gender, for example, right, gender expression, gender identity, gender fluidity and all of this. I wonder whether we are being rewired, actually. It's impossible, Naima, it's impossible. I firmly believe this. And I know that this is gonna sound radical in our day and age of like, everything is fluid and you're non-binary, you are how you feel. How do you feel today? Do you feel male or female today? You know, this is craziness and I don't uh, believe it for a second. Um, The person who coined coined the term gender identity was Mm. a man, a very sick, sick, perverted man named John Money. Are you familiar with him? I am very familiar. I have his book, uh, or not his book, I have a, the book, uh, um, it's called As Nature Made Him, The Boy yes, Who Was Made yes. As a Girl. So yeah. I, I, haven't, I haven't finished it yet, because I am very easily distracted, and I have a lot of stuff going on. But I, I started it, and it's absolutely fascinating. But it's basically, this book is the story of uh, a little boy, um, Reimer, uh, is it J- Joshua Reimer? No, Brian. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, Bruce. Bruce and Brian. Yeah. Reimer. I might there were two of them. There were twins, weren't there? They're mm. twin boys. Yes, twin boys from Canada who were born healthy male babies. Uh, you know, everything is normal. Everything. Do is you normal. mean that they were assigned male at birth? Is that yes. what you mean? The doctors. The doctors. Assigned. The doctors assigned them male at birth. Okay. Those right. patriarchal doctors. But, Terrible. You know, so they, how could they even do <laughs> such a thing? Like, how, where would they get evidence for such a thing? Oh, right. anyway. You know, we, we will never know. You know, it's just it's it's you know it's the patriarchy. So basically, these two male babies, they were everything is normal. When they were eight months old, their parents wanted to circumcise them because they had some issues or you know for whatever reason. So they took them to the hospital to be circumcised in Canada. The first baby boy was taken in. And when the procedure was happening, they tried to do the circumcision. They butchered it by accident. It was like a malfunction, the machine malfunctioned, and it completely burned this poor baby's genitalia, like completely off. So uh-huh. now you're faced with a problem of how will they fix this? They obviously took their babies home, both of them. The second one, they didn't even attempt to do circumcision. They were traumatized. Obviously, it was a big, big problem. And then who do they fall into the clutches of? They heard about this very famous doctor in uh, America by the name of John Money, who was making um, a lot of money. Uh, Ironically, his name is like so creepy to me that his name is John Money. He was Mm. making a name for himself and a lot of money um, doing sex reassignment and sex change surgery on adults, on adults in the U.S. And he basically managed to uh, lure them to his hospital. And he was like, I can fix your baby. He's this, we can fix this. And these parents had no hope. They were very right. demoralized. They were in despair. They were kind of thinking, how is our child going to grow up and be a healthy man? How is he going to be married and have children? Right. So he was like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I got this. I got this. Like, you guys are in good hands. Just hand him over to me. I'll, I'll fix this. And so what he convinced them to do was to um, basically do a gender reassignment surgery on poor Brian and turn Brian into Brenda, turn him from a male into a female baby and just raise him as a girl. And subhanAllah, this man was really- Did they do a surgery or they did, they just decided we're going to raise him as a girl? 
Did they or did uh, they actually do a surgery on, I, on I the baby? I think there were because this is a very complicated process, like scientifically and medically. Yes. So I yeah. think there there were multiple different surgeries. It's not even a oh, so this wow. poor baby had to endure a lot of psychological and physical and emotional distress. And he was very very boyish. But basically, John Money's theory was it's all nurture. There's no yes. nature. It's all oh, this yeah. is what you're saying. Like if we just rewire enough generations mm. and with enough time, we can just like rewire everything. It is impossible because John Money did his best mm. and he couldn't do it. What happened was Brian, uh, as Brenda, he was very boyish. He was very mm. masculine, very rowdy, rambunctious, loud, all the stereotypically uh, masculine kind of little boy behaviors that you would expect. He liked yeah. guns. They tried to give Brenda little doll houses and dolls to nurture like a mom, like with her baby. That's what little girls do. Brenda hated it. Brenda mm -hmm. would rather have machine guns and like little toy guns and a tinker with trucks and cars. And she played with her brother. She was actually the leader because it's really, it's, it's the older of the two brothers. So, I, the yeah. so and then uh, the younger brother, the younger twin just followed her around and, you know, they wrestled, they played in the mud. It was just, it was a mess. She was picked on in school. Everyone of could course. tell there was something off about Brenda, her teachers, you know, they were very distressed at how she was acting. She always came home dirty. The other kids did not like her because the girls thought she was a very boyish girl and didn't like yeah. her. She wasn't a normal girl because she wasn't a mm. girl. And mm. the boys didn't like her because it's it's a girl. I mean, it's a freaky kind of weird girl. She's weird. Yeah. So it was, subhanAllah, it's like a very traumatizing thing to go through. Anyway, long story short, um, when they were adults, or actually when, when he was 14, this poor boy decided, you know what, he found out the truth. He said, no, I want to go back to being a male. I'm a boy. I'm not a girl. And um, he named himself David. So mm. David Reimer. And then what happened was he committed suicide later yeah. in his adult life. And yeah. his brother, Brian, the younger twin, also committed suicide. So it's like I think he did experiments on them, didn't he, John Money? He did. This is this yeah. is the part that is also really sad. Um, I didn't want to go into too many tangents, but yes, he did experiments like very sexual in nature when they were children, when they were two, three, four years old, experimenting with the sexuality of children and two, yeah. two siblings, like having them do very disgusting sexual acts. This is why I say he was a pervert. And he had a lot of father issues, like John Money. Yeah, I read about him. Yeah. Yes, yes he did. Yeah. Was very like strict and very authoritarian. And he was a soft boy, John Money. Mm. As, when, as a boy he was softer he liked music he liked you know thinking and psychology and things like that so his father um, I guess didn't treat him in a certain way and he always saw his father as like the villain yes so he in general hated oh, he, in masculinity in general he had an issue exactly. with masculinity exactly. but you know sis yeah. I definitely want to um we need to do a reaction to what is a woman I don't know whether you've seen the documentary have you seen it yes, yes. okay girl we're doing a reaction okay it's booked <laughs> in um but you know one of the things that, that I wanted to to mention um as you were talking about uh you know what they turned into this little what they turned this little boy into which was basically a freak right yeah. and since this is a podcast, com, you know, conversation about womanhood and being a woman, uh, I I really do see an attack on womanhood that's taking place in front of us, and one of the groups that I I um I don't know why, but I I am so incensed by what is happening with young girls being encouraged to transition to be males oh my God. and being allowed to get on puberty blockers and have double mastectomies and hysterectomies because they've been convinced that they're in the wrong body and that being a boy will solve whatever issues they're having right and those and the thing is i've i've read detransitioner stories um and if you if you oh god sis it's so it's so funny to hear you say this name because I had my own period not that long ago I was obsessed with detransitioning and male to female to male transitions and female to male to female transitions so it is so interesting and fascinating to me to hear another Muslim sister talk about it. I thought I was like weirdly like fascinated by that because it's it's so crazy isn't it it's crazy? it's so it's, crazy it's, it's so pervasive mm -hmm. and what I can't stand and what makes me so angry is how these woke marketers keep pushing 
trans individuals as this beacon of 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 coolness of beauty of you know i i can't stand it anymore to see them pushing this agenda in adverts in their videos in the films i can't stand it and you know what it's got nothing to do with a person's gender expression it's got nothing to do with that because at the end of the day everyone's got their own journey but 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 where i draw the line is where no one is being real with these young people about the consequences of getting on that journey towards transition. All they do is tell them you'll be a new person, right? It's almost like a conversion, right? It's like, you, you know, you'll be like a newborn baby. All the issues that you had before, the dysphoria, the feeling uncomfortable with yourself, the discomfort with the opposite sex or your feelings towards the same sex, whatever it is that you're facing right now, you clearly are trans and once you transition there will be this heaven awaiting you and your whole life will be will be better and the reality of the hell that these young people are now facing and sis what breaks my heart is done mm -hmm. it's, it's done it's there's nothing they can do once you've had that phalloplasty no no, no forget phalloplasty because that's not where it starts so once you've had the double mastectomy, you've had the hysterectomy, you've been on hormones and your voice has changed and you're, you know, you're, you're, you've got that Adam's apple, you've got the facial hair, right? I see those poor girls who've had their breasts cut off, right? And they detransition and they're like, I know I'm not a boy, but how can, am I a girl? Look at the kind of girl that I am. I will never be a mother. I can't, you know, like who is going to love me? as I am now, I'm, they're basically, it's literally like a freak factory. And I say this in a, in a sense of not, not pointing the finger at anybody, but literally if you, you're putting them in this limbo where they are neither boy nor girl, they're just an oddity and it's nobody knows what to do with them. And they don't even know what to do with themselves. Exactly. There are, it, it's, it's, it's shocking to me. Exactly. It's pushing this new androgynous being, neither female nor male, neither feminine nor masculine. Infertile they're, as well. They're, Infertile. They're, they're, sterile, they're sterile. They're androgynous. <sighs> and they don't know. And, and you know what? I've, I've read and watched a few of these stories myself. And what the common denominator that I think I see is um, a lack of belonging and yes. a desire, like a longing to belong. Yes. This is what I see. Pe yeah. These people are longing to belong somewhere. Yeah to yeah. some sort of tribe and um, it often stems from the family so yes. i think it's very mm -hmm. important to emphasize and highlight tarbiyah the importance of tarbiyah the importance of the mother and the importance of the father in both of those parents you need both parents and uh how that affects children when they don't have it and so yeah. a lot of these poor girls and sometimes boys um but a lot of these poor children they don't really have a very close family their parents are distant or they were raised by a single mom or the father is not in the picture or whatever both parents are out working long hours and this kid had to raise herself or he had to raise himself and they fall in um uh, they fall in with a bad crowd usually online and usually TikTok this is really yeah this is this is what i was going to say right is that you know uh, allah i don't know about the parenting side of things because obviously i've seen you know fam th these these girls who are like like i couldn't explain it to my mom like i couldn't tell her uh for what you know whatever was going on but it's online isn't it that's it's where the grooming it's, it's it's they're being groomed they're, they're being, being groomed. groomed all the time being groomed exactly. and and it's and i like i said it's what what hurts me is that they present this trans identity like like you said like this loving family right this loving accepting family come as you are you know we love you as you are bullshit sorry to say <laughs> it's it's not true and and what hurts is when you see you know young people like you said looking for belonging looking for you know sometimes looking for an identity looking for some kind of status looking to be different somehow looking for people to look at them and say wow for something right mm -hmm. and they go into this into this cult slash community whatever you want to call it and they get drawn down the rabbit hole they do these irreversible and very expensive procedures that they can never come back from really most of them once they go to surgery and cutting and all that they can't come back from that right fully uh it's and, and even though the doctors tell them it's reversible and you know you can stop at any time it's, again bullshit, okay not true but they go down this rabbit hole and then if at some point they realize this hasn't solved my problems. 
I'm still depressed. I still have anxiety. I still feel scared. That was never the problem. My body was never the problem. It was my mind. And they have to try and make a way back out of that community. The community, of course, shuns them completely. So that belonging that they thought they had, they lo- they risk losing that as well, right? So I can't. I, I it's, it, it's it, all, it senses it's me. No, you're absolutely right. It's all a mirage. Like it's all false. You know, it reminds me of Shaitan. You know, Shaitan. Like وَمَا يَعِدُكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا. Shaitan does not promise you anything except deception. Wallahi, I think this is one of the tools of Shaitan in the modern age that we're living in, and it's deception. Everything that they promise you is false. It is. Just yeah, like feminism and everything that they promise women is false. And so yeah. this four young girls, they're being fa- uh, promised a lot of false things that you know, when they test that theory, like, oh, the acceptance theory, you come as you are, we love you, we're going to welcome you with open arms. As soon as you detransition and you try to leave that community, you're blackballed, you are hated, you are yeah. called names. And so these, a lot of these girls become severely depressed. Suicidal, over, suicidal. Suicidal, I, I, and yeah. their own depression. Like they were already depressed exactly. with some other stuff. Exactly. Now they're depressed that they're being picked on by the very community that they thought they had. And then they just, you know, they are, become suicidal and it's very it's tough. It's, it's really tough. May Allah protect our children, all of them. Because the thing is, you know, when you read the boy, the, the male to female transit, male to female to male detransitioners, again, same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that I remember one, one guy saying like, I cut off my, mm-hmm. my member. Mm-hmm. I'll never get it back again. Like, so, so now you did this thing. It's just, it's just, it's, it's really, I, somebody said this before, I'm sure it was Matt Walsh or somebody, but like when they look back in history and they look at this period of time that we're living in now mm-hmm. and the injustice and like you said, the deception and whatever else is going on behind the scenes that produce this abomination, I don't know what they're going to say about what we were thinking, <laughs> you know, as a society, like what were they thinking? How did they think this was going to end? May Allah protect us all and protect our children. Sis, you know we could carry on for another hour, but we mustn't. We have to do a part two, inshallah. Jazakallah kullu khair. Thank you so, so much for this amazing conversation. I want you back. I want us to do some reactions. I want us to do some reviews. I'm sure that all the viewers do as well. How can they find you, sis, and to read more of your work and also tell us more about Wife School? Um, oh yeah so Jazakallah it was really like I have a lot of fun with you sister Naima our conversations like I feel like I don't know how much time has passed it feels like five minutes in my head but <laughs> yeah. um, so Jazakallah I really really had fun um, I always do with you but uh, yeah, basically uh, so wife school inshallah I don't know when this video is going to air but um, probably after we start but wife school is yeah. going to from yeah from today when we're filming it's actually on Friday October 14th which is um, the end of this week inshallah but um, and it's basically it's going to be online and it's through Alesna Institute which is uh, my husband, Daniel Hakikaju's Institute, which I help out with. Uh, people mm-hmm. can also find me on Facebook. If you just look up Um Khalid, um, I'm, I'm, I write on Facebook. Links in the description, guys. <laughs> the links yeah. will be definitely in the description, inshallah. Um, okay. I'm hoping, inshallah, after you run the wife school for one you know, module one uh, one cohort, I hope that it will be available again, inshallah, either recorded or you know, live. Yes, either. No. yes. Yeah. So the idea of it is basically it's a live class. Oh, so this is kind of a cool thing that uh, I got this idea talking to people through just like the commenters and people who send me messages in my inbox, which I have to, if you're, if you're watching this and you sent me a message in my inbox that I have not replied to for months and months and months, I really apologize. Well, I'm so sorry. It basically, I, I go for a while. I, I, you must be the same way sister Naima or, or <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I go for a while without the luxury of free time to sit and actually check my messages. And then yeah. every now and then I'll be like, okay, oh my God, it's been like six months. I gotta, you know, so I try, I try my best. But basically a few of these ladies, I noticed a pattern in my messages that I'm getting from Muslim women, young Muslim women, sometimes mm-hmm. older. And they're just talking about, oh, um, like just fears and concerns about wifehood, getting married, trusting mm-hmm. a man being a wife to a traditional husband mm. what does any of it mean should i uh, i'm in med school should i quit i mm. you know all of these different things like can i be a mom and i work a working mom can yeah. i all of these things and wallahi they're not alone i these are questions i've dealt with myself so i'm yeah. 
very familiar with that struggle and that feeling of these like conflicting things. Yeah. So yeah. people basically, uh, I can see that this is something that's affecting all of us. So what I thought was um, nice would be like actually necessary is to have live conversations instead yeah. of this, but it's also recorded. So inshallah, the idea with Wife School is it's going to be two hours every week. It's on Friday. And then you basically, I will talk for about 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try not to go on for too long. But then after that, there's going to be an hour to an hour, 15 minutes of just back and forth and people having yeah. Q&A, because I think that's what's missing. I think genuine conversations mm. are, um, I feel like sisters need that and we need to kind of hash things out kind of face yeah. to face. Virtually. Yeah, yeah. And with personal situations as well. So you'll have to run another cohort then next year live <laughs> whenever you can fit it in your schedule, inshallah ta'ala. But for now, sis, I'm going to bid you a farewell. Jazakallah khairan for joining me. It was absolutely genius, like I said. And definitely we're going to get some videos in together, bi'idhnillah. And for those of you who stuck with us, what were your thoughts? What were your takeaways? Put them in the comments. You know, we love to see what your aha moments were, what you loved, what you did not like, what you agreed with, what you didn't agree with. We want to see in the comments, inshallah. So make sure that you've given the video a thumbs up, that you subscribe to the channel. We're on our way to 50,000 subscribers and you can help us get there. So help a sister out, subscribe to the channel and we'll see you on the next conversation. Um Khalid, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi.